Most software projects begin with requirement gathering. Functional specifications are drawn up to explain the business process for which the application is being written. This is the software phase where it is determined what an application is supposed to do. The requirement gathering process is usually insular. This phase can be very political and may even be secretive. In most cases, little attention is given to existing production systems and lessons learned from their deployment. New applications are often designed with wrong information and assumptions. DevOps greatly improves the requirement gathering phase by applying DevOps principles. DevOps allows software requirements to be based on user feedback as well as traditional functional design documents. Users can be internal business customers, not necessarily public users on the web. Before DevOps, requirements were usually written without substantial user feedback. In many cases, features were built into the application that were not needed or even asked for. In DevOps, requirement gathering is not the start of the development cycle, but just the stage in it. Feedback from maintenance and promotion feeds into the requirement gathering phase. Requirements are compiled based on real-world monitoring and feedback, and not on the feedback of the very few. DevOps allows software requirements to reflect what's possible, not just what's asked for. Often, the capabilities of an organization are much greater than the software requirements ask for. DevOps uncovers the full capabilities of an organization and allows newly designed software to leverage these capabilities. Requirement gatherers are often non-technical. DevOps adds technical staff to the requirement phase. Applications that don't exploit technology may be suggested. Requirements may not account for infrastructure issues. DevOps collaboration allows development and operations personnel to work with non-technical requirement gatherers to build an application that exploits the full capabilities of an organization. DevOps allows software requirements to reflect current skill sets. Non-technical skill sets are often overlooked in traditional waterfall-based systems, where DevOps tends to leverage various skill sets across the enterprise. Requirements often do not exploit the organization's technical skill set. Programmers know the strong points of the language they code in, and operations personnel know how the network can be a corporate asset. DevOps allows emerging applications to exploit the capabilities of the technical staff. Requirements can also consider platform and support issues. DevOps allows requirements to reflect shared goals. Traditional requirement gathering may not reflect the goals of an organization. Different groups may write requirements that are not aligned. In DevOps, requirement gathering is performed by the entire business. DevOps applications are now built with requirements that reflect the vision of the entire organization. The development phase is where the application gets coded. Here, functional requirements are translated into technical specifications. This phase is usually performed by a handful of developers. Most developers do not even see the functional requirement. To them, applications are nothing but code. Development is usually performed in a black box. Coders work with technical leads. Coders may not even know what the application is supposed to do. Applications are often never seen by outside groups until completed. Insular development phase practices lead to other problems throughout the SDLC. DevOps allows for collaboration between developers and others within the organization. Other groups, although non-technical, can offer insight on how the application is to be developed. Testers, for example, have a very structured approach to reviewing software. Software development lacks consistency and standards. Other groups can suggest good practices. Also, developers are often geographically separated. DevOps has tools that help manage and communicate with remote teams. Different skill sets must be leveraged for a development staff. DevOps provides processes and tools to allow software teams to test and to share code. DevOps allows for collaboration between development and the business. It's the business's responsibility to expose the development staff to the reasons why an application is being developed. It is the responsibility of the developers to work with the business to show them what's possible. The business often does not see an application until it's in production. DevOps practices, such as having joint application developer or JAD sessions, allow collaboration between the teams. Interaction allows innovation and the sharing of ideas. 
and developers understand the business purposes of the code. DevOps allows for collaboration between developers and quality assurance testers. Code quality becomes a shared goal, with the ultimate goal being getting the application into production. DevOps processes and tools are used to automate testing in the development phase. Almost nothing is manual anymore. Developers are exposed to the testing mindset and build quality into the code. Applications now spend less time in quality assurance and user acceptance testing. Lessons learned can now be returned to the requirement gathering phase. DevOps allows developers to perform operations tasks. This is not a small point as this very concept is at the core of the DevOps methodology. It's curious as to why developers want to perform operations tasks, why operations usually wants nothing to do with developing software. Goals between development and operations can be very different. Developers want to write and deploy code, and operations want to build and provision servers. In many cases, server and server configuration have very little to do with the applications that actually run on it. With DevOps, developers can build virtual networks to test what-if scenarios. Operations can use DevOps to build virtual environments for software developers. Both groups are now in the provisioning business. DevOps manages expectations between development and operational personnel. I'm going to give you a demonstration on continuous integration and the build and the deploy process. Now before we go into the tool, which I have on the screen right here, I want to go over a brief overview of the build deploy process as it exists today. Back in the old days, when we wanted to do a build, what we would do is we would take all of our code, we would compile it, and then we would go through a process that would take that compiled code and make it into some kind of executable format. Either an executable file, or in the Java world, we would build war files with jar files, and in .NET we do things with assemblies and we have our own build process there. Where I'm getting at with this is the build process was usually very slow, it was very manual, and it was something that we only did once in a while. Like maybe at the end of every week or at the end of every build deploy cycle, what we would do is we would take all of our code, we would consolidate it, we would build it, and we would deploy it. Now DevOps looks at this a little bit differently. We have a concept now of continuous integration, meaning that we do builds now, not maybe once a week or once every two weeks or once every build cycle, but we might do them every day, every hour, a few times an hour. How about we do a build every time there's a code change? And when we do the builds now is we have an automated build tool that actually does that. Now. A few years back, maybe 10 years back, there were some Java tools out there that would start to automate the build process, such as Ant. Ant comes to mind where you would build Ant scripts or maybe Maven scripts that would actually take the code and compile the code, put the jar dependencies that were in there, and then deploy the code. But Ant was kind of still kind of manual, if you think about it, where there was still some steps in there that you had to kind of put in, maybe some runtime parameters, et cetera. Now, DevOps tools take that concept of automated build to the nth degree, meaning that we have tools that can continuously do builds, continuously do integration, and continuously do deployments. The tool I'm going to show you is called Jenkins. Now Jenkins is a DevOps-E like continuous integration tool that performs our builds for us. So over the next couple minutes or so is I'm going to give you a brief overview on Jenkins. First of all, Jenkins is free. It's an open source project and you can download it and install it on just about anything. So whatever you're running, you most likely could get Jenkins to run on it. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you a demo on creating a new Jenkins job. As you can see, I have some already set up here, but let me go to the left, click on new item, and we will build a new Jenkins job. And I'm going to give you the cliff notes because I just want you to see just kind of the main features of Jenkins. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a freestyle project which I will call DevOps Jenkins 
demo. And notice we could do Maven, external, multi-configuration, or build a job based on an existing one we already have. But we're going to stick with Freestyle Project. Click OK. And I'm just going to show you some options here. We can put in our description. And let me show you the options for creating this item. I'm going to navigate down. This is a big one here. Source code management. By default, we have CVS, CVS project set, and subversion, or none, meaning that in this case we have our Java code local. It's important to point out, though, that we do have some plugins that we could use to actually use public repositories, such as if you use Git, we could use Git as our source code management tool, or Bitbucket. Bitbucket uses Git and some other ones in the background for our source code management. This is important because what we can do is we could automate builds based on the code that's in those repositories, either public or private, which is very important if you work in a distributed team, especially a DevOps team, because you could have developers all over the world contributing to that build and checking their code into Git, and you could actually build a project based on what their code is. So let me navigate down a little bit further and explain to you build triggers. We could build after other projects are built periodically, or we could pull the source control management tool. Now this is importantly, especially these two right here, we can schedule builds. We could say every day we want you to go to this repository and build this application. We could say every minute go to that repository, build that application. Or this one here, which is the most interesting, which is pulling the source control management tool. How about this? How about we want to schedule and automatically fire a build off every time the source has changed within our source control management tool? Pretty cool, because that way what we can do is we can actually automate or continuously integrate any changes that we have based on code that's checked in. Now, obviously, that's going to lead to some QA or some UAT issues, but I'll leave it to you to figure out exactly how you want to handle those. Now, moving on, we also have some additional build steps where we can actually here invoke ant scripts, shell scripts, Windows batch commands, and we have post build actions where we can build other projects. For testing, we can publish JUnit test results or this one here, provide an email notification. So these are all the different parameters you can set if you want to automate your build process. And to do so, we're using Jenkins to actually continuously integrate any code changes that we might have that we may build them and maybe deploy them into production.